everyone. This is Deborah Dudak. I'm a board member with the Illinois State Historical Society, and I'm pleased to present our history happy hour for the month of November. This month, we have uh, Mark Walzinski. He is a park historian for the Starved Rock Foundation, located at Starved Rock State Park in Utica, Illinois. Mark's studies focus on the Franco-American history of the Western Great Lakes and the Illinois country during the last 40 years of the 1600s. He is also an affiliate with the Illinois Archaeological Survey. Mark also has three amazing books, which you need to go run and buy or check out from your public library. Um, if your library is closed or you're looking for a good gift idea, you can purchase all three of his books um, online or from your local book retailer. Um, the newest one of which is The History of Starved Rock, which is on my list of items to read this winter um, when I'm inside and looking for a good read. So Mark, thank you very much for the book because I'm really looking forward to reading it. And um, remember at any time, friends, as you enjoy our program, please consider to become a member because we want you all to join our amazing fellowship of historians and history lovers, anybody who loves getting free cool stuff in the mail, anybody who loves reading really amazing and gripping historical accounts, or somebody who just really enjoys really great programs and symposiums, we're really excited to have you as a member. And if you don't wanna be a member, that's okay. We understand not everybody is a joiner, uh, but please throw us a couple of bucks our way. Uh, you can always go to our website um, and make a donation at any time. And remember that state historical society memberships make a great Christmas gift. You can send them out virtually to your friends and family because it costs you zero in shipping. Uh, so please consider becoming a member and uh, joining our amazing group of uh, historians and history lovers. Um, and so with that, I will hand over tonight's presentation to Mark. So Mark, please take it away. All right, thank you, Deb. Thank you very much. All righty, is the, uh, do you see the presentation? I do, it looks fantastic. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much for the, Wonderful introduction, Deb. Um, this is kind of a, a, a difficult subject for me to do tonight, the way, because I do, a, I, I usually do a presentation on each one of these tribes that we're going to talk about. So I'm kind of like cutting and pasting and putting a couple of, uh, you know, a little bit of each different tribe on together to make this one presentation. So I hope we can, um, I don't cut too much and uh, we find some value in it. Anyway, this is going to be about the North Native Indians, Native Americans of Northern Illinois, the historic periods, which means 1673 through the 1830s. Um, we have to realize too that Native American occupation of any site, of any place, was dynamic. In other words, they moved around a lot even though they may have lived in one place for 100 years, 200 years, they still moved around someplace and they came from other places as well. And this is usually because of a number of different circumstances, sometimes good and sometimes bad. For example, climate had a lot to do with where Native Americans lived. For example, between 1350-ish and 1850-ish, there was a period that we call the Little Ice Age. And the coldest time of this Little Ice Age was between about 1745, 1645 and 1715. And that's when the French were here. That's the time of the French exploration in North America. And that's when they started writing things down. So the, when a climate changes, when there's an ice age, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be cold. It means that it's, there may be droughts over here. There may not be droughts here. It may snow here when it normally doesn't, which means that the plants that grow in certain areas may die off. They may change their range, which means the animals who feed on these types of plants are going to move as well, which means the people that depend on those animals for food are going to move too. Sometimes war can change an occupation of a site. For example, if you've heard of the, what they call the beaver wars, that's when the Iroquois Indians from during the 16, late 1630s, 40s and 50s um, went to war after the tribes who lived in Huronia, which would be Southern Ontario, such as the Wendat, uh, Tobacco Nation, the Eries. And 
those tribes scattered. Some of them ended up in Wisconsin. Some of them were incorporated into the uh, Iroquois tribe or confederation or association. And from that point on, they didn't live in the same place where they did for hundreds of years before. Trade opportunities changed as well. For example, when we talk about the Illinois Indians, the Kaskaskia Indians, as we'll see, they moved towards where they can get trade opportunities. For example, before when the French first came to the Upper Great Lakes, they would travel as far as southern, uh, the south shore of Lake Superior, they get trade items. But when the Mississippi River connected the Gulf of Mexico with the Illinois country, um, then they moved towards the Mississippi River. Also, exploitation of the natural resources have some bearing too. Um, Native Americans would go continue to, to, to get food from the same places. They didn't chance going someplace new because if it didn't work out, they could die. So they would keep going over and over back to the same places and sometimes it would be too much for that place to handle and they would have to move. So there's a lot of reasons for why they changed. Now here's a sack and a fox. Sack and fox. Mm -hmm. Sack and the fox Indians. We right now, the, sock, the fox Indians live in, they have a settlement in Pema, Iowa. They originally came from north, according to their legendary history, north of Quebec. Okay. Wait a minute. There we go. North of Quebec. Okay. And the Sauk Indians here in the yellow, you can see they came all the way down by Rhode Island, across New York, down the Allegheny River, down the Ohio River, up the Seattle River to Detroit, where we know they were here in 1640. And look how they moved after that. They moved here to what could be near Ludington, Michigan, across the Straits of Mackinac, over here in this part of Wisconsin, the Green Bay area, down the Wisconsin River, through to Illinois, and ended up here in Iowa. And so this is only in a short period of time, within a couple hundred years, okay? So since the last ice age, end of the last ice age, anthropologists have five general categories of human occupation here in Illinois. We got the paleo people, those were the mammoth hunters, uh, the archaic people, which was the longest period of time from 10,000 years ago to about 2,500 years ago. And these are your hunter gatherers. Then comes the woodland period. And the woodland period is when agriculture really took, took hold. Um, since people uh, weren't out chasing the herds all the time, um, they planted crops. Uh, so they're gonna stick around where those crops are. Uh, little the groups of 20, 30, 40, 50 family members in that group now got larger and larger and they married into other groups. So from going from 20, 30, 40, 50 people in this group, they went to hundreds, several hundreds, which leads us to the Missis Mississippian period where those, these were complete cities. When you talk about places like Cahokia, where there were cities, essential cities based on corn and agriculture, and then you had the other like suburbs, farming villages that would actually supply Cahokia, their corn, which leads us to, after they fell apart, that civilization fell apart. Then we have what's called the proto-historic period. Proto-historic period is when uh, the Europeans were in North America, but they hadn't made it here to Illinois yet. Their goods, their trade goods, made it long before they did, sometimes 20 or 30 years before the actual Europeans arrived. And then we have the historic period. We're living in the historic period today. The historic period is when indigenous people first met the French here in Illinois who wrote down what they saw. Because before this time, what we know about the Native Americans is basically through archaeology uh, and a little bit of linguistics, but mainly through archaeology. And there's a lot of interpretation that goes with that. But when Father Marquette, for example, came through here in 1673, Louis Joliet, he passed the village and he says, hey, there's so many, so many cabins at that village and this is what they call it. So he could actually write it down. And this happened at different times in different places. For example, they met the Illinois, the French met the Illinois in Wisconsin. They met them in Missouri and then they met them in the actual Illinois country. So let's talk about the Illinois, our state's named after an Indian tribe. 
And it's not unusual because so is Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas, and, and other states as well. The French first encountered the Illinois Indians at La Pointe. Now, La Pointe was somewhere near this site here. This is the south shore of Lake Superior near Ashland, Wisconsin. Uh, we would call it Chiquamanon Bay up there. They call it Chiquamanon Bay. And it was where the Jesuit Claude Jean Elouez first met a group of Illinois Indians there in the year 1666. That La Pointe area was a wintering village, a winter with uh, tribes who were wintering there. So a delegation, most likely because where they described their homeland, where they were from, were probably Peoria Indians. When Jacques Marquette took that um, mission over in 1669, he also met the Illinois Indians. And he was also given a, a slave boy to help him learn the Miami Illinois Indian language as well. And so did Claude Joan Eloise, Eloise. They all they had to know how to speak to these people. They learned old Algonquin or El Ojibwa languages like that, which is in the same linguistic family as Miami, Illinois. So once they learned those basic languages and languages like Illinois would have been a lot easier for them to learn. Claude de Blon and Alioues met the Illinois Indians on, uh, at a village in, uh, on the Fox River in Wisconsin too. The early French missionaries wrote that the Illinois called themselves Inoka or Inlaka, okay? If you've heard the terms, and I'm sure you have, Illini Wek or Illini, they are historically and linguistically wrong. There were no Illini Wek Indians, okay? Illini Wek or Illinuek means we speak the same, and it's in the plural form of the Ojibwa. You see the EK here, Illini Wek. What that means is we speak the same. When the Jesuits first made it, to the Western Great Lakes. They wanted to know who lives out there. What rivers are there? Are any seas or any people? Who, what, what can we learn about what's out there? So the Ojibwas told the missionaries that the Illinois live out there. Okay, so what does that mean? It means same speakers. The problem was is the Illinois were not the same speakers as the Ojibwa. But the people who lived in between the Illinois and the Ojibwa the Miami were the same speakers as the Illinois. So that's how that got mixed up. And by the mid 1800s, John Gilmary Shea, who really didn't know much about the language at all, which I don't either, but that's where this has got turned into an Indian tribe. Well, it's not an Indian tribe. It's, we speak the same, okay? So you can see here, this is from Father Gravier, the Jesuit who was here in the Illinois country in the 1680s, 1690s. Uh, you can see this is one of his one of his notes in Oka, Illinois people. Now these people, these Jesuits were linguists. You have polyglots and polyglots speak several languages, but linguists learn how these languages work. They have to know how to talk to these people, okay? They have to know present tense, past tense, plural, and things like this, and they tear these languages apart. And this is what from this comes from the same word list the same dictionary that uh, Father Gravier had written. So we can take it to the bank that Inoka were the Illinois people. That's what they call themselves. So you're on good footing if you call them the Illinois or the Inoka. And as Natalia Marie Belting wrote sometimes spoke, said some year, number of years ago, she was from the U of I, the Illinois are an Indian tribe, the Illini are a football team. So the Illinois, just like other Native American groups, the Anishabek, Miami, Sioux, Iroquois, these are essentially umbrella terms for a group of sub-tribes. Now looking at the Illinois, we have the Kaskaskia, Peoria, Cahokia, Tamarole, we have all these different sub-tribes. Um, there were probably, it's hard to really tell, eight, 10, 12 different of these Illinois groups. And what they did is they had the same culture, the same customs, they spoke the same language and they intermarried. And the word Illinois is an umbrella term for these different sub-tribes. And you can see this, the kinship bonds that they would have formed by intermarrying with each other was the glue that really kept these groups together. Now this is the same thing, for example, the Sioux Indians. There were no Sioux Indians. 
tribes. Sioux is an umbrella term for a bunch of different sub-tribes and groups. If you were in Minnesota, southern Minnesota in say the year 1820, and you were to meet a Native American there and you say, hey, uh, what are you? He would say, I'm either Medeo Wankatan, Sasetawan, Wapakute, Wapatetan. If you were farther west at the Dakota's Minnesota border, uh, they'd say, I'm Yankton, Yanktonai. If you went farther west into South Dakota, they'd say, I'm Tetan, I'm Black Kettle, I'm Sanzark, I'm Oglala. But collectively, those groups who speak the same language, who intermarry and have the same customs, collectively, they were the Sioux. So not only is it an, were the Sioux, the Illinois, the Iroquois ethnic groups, but they were also language groups. The family unit was the foundation of the Illinois village. Okay? Every family member had a role to play to make sure the group as a whole survived. Men, for example, men were the hunter warrior. They who killed the animals. They were the guys who protected the village. A good hunter made a better warrior. A good warrior made a better hunter, and so on and so forth. Now, even though women didn't have a, from our, from our perspective, uh, a glamorous role like the men would have had, they were the people who actually had a very, very important role. They grew the food, they raised the kids, they moved the village whenever, in times of migration. They did a lot of things. And without them, the men would have been in trouble. Then there's the elderly. They didn't have, obviously, they didn't have encyclopedias, they didn't have Wikipedias, they didn't have the internet back in those days. So the elderly, the people who managed to survive, that lived to their 40s, 50s, maybe 60s, had seen a lot of things. They had been through a lot in their life. They were the go-to people. They were the, they were the libraries. You went to them to ask them questions. For example, let's say they were going to winter. This group was going to winter at this area. But when they got there, they found there's no game. But it's 20 below zero and they can't move. They're in a real fix. Grandpa, grandma, what happened? Have you ever had this before? Yeah, this happened to us once before, many moons ago. And here's what we found out. This, it's going to be tough, but we found out if we do this, we'll survive. So you can see just how important their role was. Children, they had menial tasks to do too. For example, when we talk about the summer buffalo hunt, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, the entire village goes out and hunt. The men kill the animals. The women butcher the animals, skin, skin the hides save the horns, the tendons, and, and they cut the meat into little thin strips to be smoked. So the elderly would put the meat, the thin strips of meat over the top of a grate, and they would basically dehydrate it you know, over a low heat. While the children were out running around looking for sticks to keep the fire going because they're on a prairie and wood is basically few and far between out there. So everybody had a role to keep this group going. Adolescence was a time when to learn skills so that kids can become capable adults. The Illinois had a practice of what we call a seasonal subsistence cycle. Every year they gather at large summer agricultural villages to plant crops. After the crops have been established, they're growing, everything's looking good, they leave the village for the summer bison hunt. It's usually three weeks, four weeks, maybe five weeks and they go out into the prairies. The entire village participates in the buffalo hunt. After that's done, the meat's dried, the hides, hides are stored. They come back to the village and they harvest and they store their maize. And they separate the kernels from the cob by a process called shelling with these shells. The same word we use today when we take the kernels off the cob. When that's done, the corn's buried for next year, which will be next year's crop, and it'll also be food uh, in case they need it. The, the village will disperse by little small family and clan groups for the winter hunt. In historic times, they would hunt for beaver and different types of fur-bearing animals, so otter, mink, that they would trade to the French. And in winter is when the hides are in the best quality. After the winter hunt was over, they returned back to the summer village to plant their crops and the entire cycle would begin anew. Illinois groups, just like all other native groups, had bloodline divisions, what we call clans. 
Some of them are bear clan, otter clan, crane clan, for example. And this is kind of important because these were actual bloodline divisions. These clan had a totem, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> had a particular totem, an animal that represented their clans. Lots of these different clans had specific roles. Leadership, the her hereditary leadership would come from this clan. Um, these clans here were good at doing this, good at doing that. And one Ojibwa clan, for example, they could tell that a person might have been a member of their clan because they went bald before some of the others did. Uh, that clan, that totem was oftentimes war on each clan member, giving them a certain identity. But it was a bloodline division, which meant that if you were a member of the bear clan, for example, you would not, you would never dream of marrying another person of the bear clan because that would mean interbreeding, okay? Um, we may think that's a really strange way of doing this, but when you think it wasn't that long ago when European monarchs were marrying relatives and we know what can happen with that. So these clans were very important to these people. As a matter of fact, some tribes like the Ojibwa, who we'll talk about in a little while, they were forbidden to even marry someone of the same clan, even though the person was from far away it just happened to have that same totem for them. So they took this stuff really, really seriously. They didn't really have what we would call a government, but I can't think of a better word to use for it. Like all other Amerindian groups, they had basically a consensus form of government where we had chiefs and elders. You had village chiefs, you had lesser chiefs, you had elders. Everything was done by a group with the best with the group's um, protection being paramount for the group, okay? In other words, you had a civil chief, for example. You probably never heard of the civil chief. He would be comparable to like a, a mayor of a village. He was, uh, he was an important figure, but he tried to get the village to make sure everything was going fine. Hey, I heard you people aren't getting along with you people over here. Hey, come on, let's get together. Let's find out what's wrong between everybody. We got to settle this issue. The civil chief was all, also the person who led that village on the summer buffalo hunt. So you can see if some of the, if there were several thousand people involved in this summer buffalo hunt, it took a lot of coordination to make sure that they did it right. Because if they missed the opportunity to get those buffalo, somebody took off early, somebody got there too fast or something like that, that would affect the entire group. They also had what was called ward chiefs. <coughs> Excuse me, these are the guys you have heard about. Black Hawk, Pontiac, Tecumseh, so on and so forth. These guys were war leaders. During any other time of the year, they were just an average bloke inside living in the village. Here we go. War chiefs, they recruited volunteers by the rhetoric, convincing them of the need to redress perceived wrongs. This group over there did something to us. This tribe over there did something to us. We need to retaliate for that. So they would use his, his, his skills as an order to try to get a group of people together, a group of warriors together to go and strike back for what the other people did to them. Um, if a volunteer says, no, I, I really don't want anything to do with this, that wasn't an issue. These war parties were small, mobile groups who employed hit and run tactics. They used surprise, stealth, deception, and ambush to achieve their military objective. Now, here's a group of Native Americans here. You can see he's holding his war club here. So we think, well, that's really weird. Why did they paint themselves up and do things like that? Well, they're really not that much different from us nowadays because we are holding our weapons, painting our faces up and doing basically the same thing in the same style. Small mobile groups who hit a military objective and then get the heck out of there. So things aren't really that different. One of the main modes of transportation for the Illinois Indians were these. These are, we would call them dugout canoes. You see them all over the world. Uh, the French were to call them pirogues. The Illinois called them misura. So since these woodland Mississippian historic period Indians lived along riverways like the Illinois River, where you had large 
uh, trees, cottonwood trees that are grow fast. And the wood is very thin or very, very light, uh, pliable. What they would do is after the tree is felled, they would put red hot embers on one side of the log and they would let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. Then they would scrape it. You can see this person here is scraping that. And they would repeat the process and do it again and do it again and do it again until it was it was uh, sufficiently deep enough uh, for a number of people. And some of these dugouts could hold 30 people as well. Um, horses, for example, never came, never never were much to the Illinois Indians until about the mid 1700s or so when they were used as pack animals and draft animals, uh, especially with the Northern Indians, kind of few and far between because a good rule of thumb is, is horses and trees don't get along. And this is a picture of a dugout canoe when I worked for the state of Illinois, Department of Natural Resources, we found one of the guys I worked with found this dugout canoe at the Forks. And the Forks is where the uh, Kankakee, Kankakee and Des Plaines River meet to make the Illinois River. And this was in a pile of driftwood. It's been there for some time. I examined it and I could see that this was made in the traditional fashion where they would burn it. But you could see they used modern or uh, they used metal tools like an adze, which if this had been made by a Potawatomi in mid 1700s, they would have had. But unfortunately, this boat here might have been a Boy Scout project from the 1960s that somehow ended up in the river. But I'll tell you, it was a really, really interesting day. Illinois villages, they didn't have walls or fortifications like Huron or Iroquois did because the, up there, there was a lot of warfare, intertribal warfare going on and they needed to protect themselves. The Meskwaki, as we'll talk about, they had fortified villages during times of war here. But the Illinois lived in long linear villages that were spread out along a waterway like the Illinois River. Sometimes they were at portages or other riverine features. If there was a portage, that meant there was probably rapids, which meant there was probably aerated water. So it was a good place to have a village. Um, in the 1660s and 1670s, this is where the Illinois lives. These are some of the places. Here we have uh, Lake Superior near Ashland, Wisconsin. You have near, Ber new, uh, new, near Berlin, Wisconsin, here on the Fox River. You have Kaskaskia here uh, in LaSalle County. You got Clark County, Missouri, right over here. And then you have down south here near Cahokia. This is the picture of the 1673 Peoria village that um, Marquette and Joliet visited. And you can see this is how the Peoria would have said their name. Piwa that's what they call themselves, a term that means the dreamers. They were the, they were the traditionalists. Um, and we know this because just like I showed you the Anoka reference, they also, the missionaries also wrote this down. So we know that the Peoria, which we call them, were actually spelled like that. Another village that Marquette encountered and which Joye encountered was the first Kaskaskia. Not the state capital down in southern Illinois, but the one near Star Rock. You can see this tree line right here, that bluff tree line, that's along the Illinois River. This is where in 1670 Marquette and Joliet stopped to visit the Illinois River. Star Rock is just about a mile downstream from there. In 1673, Marquette counted 74 cabins. Roughly 20 people for cabin, 74, 1450, 1480 people in that village, um, give or take 100 or 200. But these were only Kaskaskias. When Marquette returned to that site two years later, there were several thousand people living in that village. There were 1,500 men alone, as he has written, and plus children and women and other people that were quite numerous. When Father Allouez was there in 1677, he counted 351 cabins, which would have took the total of over 7,000 people in one village. And when LaSalle arrived in New Year's Day of 1680, his priest, Father Membre, counted 460 cabins. So that's quite a few. So why, why was this happening? Well, um, for two reasons. Number one, since they didn't live in fortified villages, the Illinois would lots of times consolidate when there was a threat. And at this time, the Iroquois, probably the most powerful fighting force in the North American continent at that time, uh, had been threatening to attack the Illinois, but more likely is the French who came here represented trade goods. 
okay, things that they really wanted, the things that the Illinois would go all the way up to Lake Superior to buy a few of. In 1683, LaSalle built Fort St. Louis, Fort St. Louis, on top of Star of Rock, okay, and he was able, because of this Iroquois threat, he was able to bring together a number of different groups of Indians, Miami, Shawnee, and other tribes, where they settled in northern Illinois. Um, historians call this LaSalle's colony. I really don't like that term, but you know what we're talking about when we, uh, when we use that term. And this colony, these settlements stretched all the way from the Iroquois River, uh, north to the Forks, of where the Des Plaines meets the Kankakee, all the way west to near Hennepin in Putnam County and in Bureau County. Okay, so this was a huge group of Indians they were living there at that time. How many? We really don't know. Uh, LaSalle's maps and what he had written about this colony are they're irreconcilable, so we'll never know. Matter of fact, here's a copy of LaSalle's map, and you can see when we're talking about this area here, you can see the Iroquois County over here. You got the Miami here at the Forks. You got the Piankasha here in Illinois. You got Fort, Fort St. Louis here, Shawnee, Kilaticas here somewhere beneath the Big Bend over in, in um, uh, Putnam County near Hennepin. So it's kind of interesting. This is a kind of cool, kind of cool map. When we look at these settlements between 1683 and 1689-ish, let's take a look at the Miami. Remember said that Illinois had their own different sub-tribes, subgroups, the Kaskaskia, Cahokia, Peoria, well, so did Miami. They had the Miami proper or, or the Crane clan. They had the Kilatika. You had the Wheatanon. You had the Piankasha. So these groups together were living all the way from the Iroquois River all the way to near Hennepin in Putnam County. The Illinois, about 6,000 Illinois, were living at their village over where that first Kaskaskia from. Um, which subtribes, we don't know because LaSalle map, LaSalle's map kind of has them all over the place at the same time. For example, you can see Illinois living here, here, and then this stream, and this is in Iowa, and then you have Illinois living down here in Southern Illinois. So were these Illinois part of the group? We don't know. Uh, then we had Shawnee, or the French, this is what the French would call them. But here's a really interesting group. This is the Odo, um, who La LaSalle referred to in his writings as the Missouri. The Odo and Missouri were closely associated tribes. They were a trans-Mississippi tribe, meaning they lived west of the Mississippi River. Um, we know that during the time of Marquette in 1673, they were living on the Des Moines River. They were Shiwir speakers or Siouan speakers, okay, not Algonquian speakers like most of these, like the Miami, Illinois, and uh, a number of the other groups, Shawnee. But more importantly, they were bison hunters. And that's important because they were bison hunters and the Illinois were bison hunters as well. LaSalle's legal contract from the crown only allowed him to take to trade in bison hides. So that meant that he had to align himself and make deals with bison hunting tribes like the Odo and like the Illinois. Now the Odo lived on the Des Moines River at this time, which was a tributary of the Mississippi from the West, while the Illinois lived on the Illinois River, which is a Mississippi tribute tributary from the east. So you can see in LaSalle's plan, he's trying to funnel these heavy bison hides where he can put them on a boat and bring them down to the Gulf of Mexico in, in with very little work. Matter of fact, he even uh, tried, they tried attempting to build a 42 foot boat in 1680, but it just never, never happened over in Crave Court right near Peoria. So that was his plans. Now, if you can imagine if you're going to take bison hides. And these French in the Illinois country, they didn't use those large 18-man canoes like they used up in the upper Great Lakes and Lake Superior and places like that. They used two-man canoes. The rivers are too shallow, there were too many rapids, too many portages. How many trips you'd have to make in a two-man canoe to bring a couple of bison hides all the way up to Montreal. So this is all figured into LaSalle's work, getting these tribes to bring their stuff downstream right down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. By 1689, most of the non-Illinois groups have left the colony. A combination of 
lack of natural resources when you have all these thousands of people going after the same stuff. Um, you also have uh, intertribal disputes that would break out in between the different groups, things from a long time ago that they decided uh, um, to argue over. 1691, the Illinois that remained at Kaskaskia moved to Lake Peoria. By 1691, there was only about 1,000 Illinois left living at Kaskaskia, about 5,000 more of them were living at Lake Peoria. 1698, the Cahokia and Tamarora were on the Mississippi River down in Southern Illinois. And near 1700, the Kaskaskia subtribe and a couple smaller subtribe left the Lake Peoria area and moved with the Jesuits to DePera Creek, Creek of the Fathers, and that would have been somewhere near today's uh, St. Louis. Why did they move there? Is because that's when Deaverville have, had found, located the mouth of the Mississippi River from the Gulf of Mexico. And it appeared that this is where trade is going to come from now. This is going to be a, a good place to be. So they left in 1703, they left uh, the DePera Creek uh, settlement, settled at the Kaskaskia River, where our first day capital was. And also that same year, another group of Native Americans who were not Illinois joined the Illinois and became an Illinois subtribe in 1703, and that's the Michigamia. Between 1712 and the 1750s, the Peoria Indians subtribe lived at Lake Peoria or at Starved Rock. Actually, they go back all the way to the year 1691 between those two sites. They stay, there's a reason for it. They separated themselves from the rest of the group, right? The rest of the Illinois subtribes are down on the Mississippi River. They stayed separated up on the Illinois River. Remember, they were the dreamers. That's what the word, that's what they're naming, the, the traditionalists. And this was the key to their success, as we'll see. From 1750s to 1732, the Peoria's moved to Southern Illinois and then in Missouri. So by 1750s, 1760s, here's, where, here's the Illinois villages right here. Cahokia, St. Louis, near Fort Bichard, Kaskaski area. They were losing population fast though. It was an estimated 9,600 Illinois, not counting the Michigami at first contact. By 1700 and 1740, they lost about 40% of their population. 1740, 1763, they lost about 20% of that population. And by 1769, there was only one fifth the number of Illinois as there were a century before. And the trend continued. And reasons for this is because European disease for which they had no immunity against killed many of them. Monogamy, uh, they converted the Roman, many of them converted to Roman Catholicism and they weren't uh, polygamists anymore. They had one wife, which knocked down uh, the birth rate, war with other tribes, alcoholism, and just plain the loss of their land and their culture. They were just a defeated downtrodden people at that time. They're down, but not out. 1773, they sold land to a British land company. Two Illinois groups allied with George Rogers Clark in 1778 and signed treaties in 1803, 1818, 1832. 1832, the three, re three remaining sub-tribes, or just a, not very many, merged with the larger Peoria group. The Peoria, there were more Peoria than the three other sub-tribes combined. Once again, that isolation was the key to their survival. 17th, or 1832, they moved to the reserve in Kansas, where in 1854, their Miami cousins merged with the Peoria and became the Consolidated Peoria Tribe. In 1868, they moved to Oklahoma and became the Peoria Indian Tribe of Illinois, or of, of Oklahoma, where they have tribal headquarters in Miami, Oklahoma, where they, are, where they operate casinos, golf courses, motels, and things like that. Very interesting group of people. Now let's talk about their close cousins, the Miami. Um, when you read uh, uh, books about the Illinois and Miami, there's a close association between the two. Um, sometimes it's difficult to separate the Miami from the Illinois because they did a lot of the same things the same, but their tenure here in today's Illinois was very brief. Uh, part of LaSalle's colony till about 1689-ish or so. We know that when the colony broke apart, they moved to the Chicago area and they lived there in the 1690s um, around a mission, uh, a Jesuit mission uh, that was run by Father Panay in the 1690s. 
basically during historic times, they lived in north, uh, northwest Indiana. They lived in Ohio, southeast and southwest Michigan. They also sojourned in today's Wisconsin. There was, no one knows why, but there was enmity between the Illinois and their cousins, the Miami, which was exploited by the Jesuits in historic times because the Jesuits did not want secular intrusion into their, their claim territory out here. They wanted to deal with the tribes on their term and they knew the trouble that traders have brought. Um, so they tried to exclude them. And the best way to do this is get the Miami even more angry at the Illinois. So the Illinois won't go hunt because uh, the threat of, of warfare with the Miami. Then here's, a, here's a, another interesting group. Anishinaabek. We call them, or that's what they call themselves. Anishinaabek, um, Potawatomi, Odawa, or as we would call them, Ottawa. And Ojibwa. Ojibwa, if you've been to northern Minnesota, you heard of Chippewa, put an O in front of Chippewa, you got Ojibwa. Um, we know them as the th three fires in historic times. They were once a single group, but according to their tradition, they come from the east as a group. And when they got here to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, they split up and went different directions. Um, the Ojibwa went through, ended up in northern Wisconsin and into Minnesota the farthest group in Minnesota are known as the Pillagers. Another 20% of them remained in Canada, Ontario, north of Lake Superior. Uh, the Potawatomi went south into Michigan, southern Michigan, and along the Door County Peninsula. And then the Ottawa, or the Odawa, stayed here in the Upper Peninsula and the upper part of the Lower Peninsula. They occupied and continued to occupy the Upper Great Lakes region. It's very difficult to separate their groups too. In the same canoe, you will have two Potawatomis and an Ojibwa and an Adawa in the same. So when we say the Potawatomis did this, um, sometimes you run, you can run into other group members uh, being in the same canoe or participating in the same activities. They arrived in Illinois 1740-ish. As the Illinois were moving out of Illinois, the Potawatomis were moving into Illinois, okay? They lived along creeks, rivers, and prairie groves. Illinois River, uh, uh, Fox River, Kankakee River, creeks like Indian Creek, and prairie groves like Pawpaw Grove, Shabna Grove, Earlville Grove, um, little treed oases out in the middle of, uh, of the vast prairies. So you can see the Illinois prairies basically look like this, and you have your groves of timber out there where deer lived, you had water supplies and things like that. And that's where they, they lived. They practiced a hunting fishing culture more so than they did corn. It was, to them it was hunting and fishing and they also grew corn, whereas the Illinois grew corn and grew crops and then supplemented their diets with hunting and fishing. Uh, they lived in small villages, which needed a lot of territory. Their villages, 50, 100, 200 people or so, lived, as I said, out in the middle of those prairies in these groves in order to feed them required a lot of territory to survive. Uh, if the group got too big, then it would split off from the main group as far away as it could, but yet not too far because it would be close enough in case uh, they, they needed their assistance. Um, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, Potawatomi attacked the Lake the Peoria at Lake Peoria in 1751, 1752, and by 1763, they claimed the land all the way from the forks of the Des Plaines and Kankakee River to Star Rock. This is a picture of them white fishing at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan during the spring whitefish run. And this is how they would fish at night. This is a famous picture. Sometimes they would also build traps and different types of seines and things. I thought I'd throw this into some of their beadwork and art. Look at the little seed beads and they have the floral designs. Once you see these a couple of times, then you can tell right away, yep, that's Potawatomi or that's Ojibwa. You can see the beautiful floral designs with the seed beads, just a beautiful work of art. They were the people who were in Illinois when the Americans came out in the 1820s and 1830s and conflicts were going to happen. Americans wanted to 
plow the prairies, cut down the trees, plant crops and things like that. Well, the Potawatomis, on the other hand, they needed those prairies, they needed those trees, they didn't want them gone. They're two mutually exclusive cultures. One thing that Americans learn is to don't interfere with their fishing. Right here, this is Indian Creek, Northern LaSalle County. During this creek, usually in May, the red horse sucker, or we call them red horse carp, but they're actually a sucker, migrate by the thousands through these streams in Northern Illinois, like in, uh, like I say, in LaSalle County. The Potawatomis who live six miles above here depended on those fish for their food. So what happened was, this is what these buildings here are what we call the Davis settlement. Back in the 18th, early 1830s, a man by the name of Davis started this settlement here and he built a mill. Well, in order to build a mill, you have to have some kind of water power. But this creek can get very, very shallow and turn into a trickle by summer. So in order to have water power, you build a mill pond. Well, in order to build a mill pond, you have to dam up the creek. You dam up the creek and you prevent the carp from going upriver to the village. And so the Potawatomi would come at night, tear the dam apart, as the story goes. The men would, would rebuild it. And then this happened for a few days until finally they caught the Potawatomi's tearing the dam apart. And they, as they say, put the boot to them, which is a really bad mistake because they came back in force and they killed 15 men, women, and children at that village. And this is a, one of the markers here. This is, they call the Indian Creek Massacre site. Happened in May, 1832. That's how important fish were to the Potawatomi's. They made a number of treaties with the government, 1816, Portage the Sioux. In 1817, Illinois Territorial Governor Edwards was ordered by the War Department to begin proceedings to extinguish the title of Indian lands east of the Illinois River, which meant south of Starve Rock. Um, the two most important treaties was the 1832 Treaty of Chicago and then the 1833 Treaty of Chicago. And this one where the Potawatomi agreed to cede all their land, whatever holdings they had east of the Mississippi River and then move west. It was 1833 where the uh, Chief Justice of the man who became Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, John Dean Caton, saw thousands and thousands of Potawatomi Indians at this uh, council, this treaty council. Uh, Caton also opened up the first law office in Chicago of that year. And um, so as we look at this, you can see as the Americans came out, they were whittling away at the Potawatomi land. One of the most notable Potawatomi chiefs was Shabanon. He was a, actually, a, he was an Adawa who married a Potawatomi woman, but he was a chief at a Potawatomi village. Um, he fought with the British in the War of Eight during the War of 1812. Um, one of the reasons is, see, the French had a model and the British had a model. Americans followed the, followed the old British model about dealing with the tribes. The French, in order to come out to the West, you couldn't, this wasn't the United States. You can just, you couldn't say, hey, I'm just gonna be a fur trader. I'm, I'm gonna go out and trade with the Indians. It didn't work like that. You had to have a royal license. You were essentially an ambassador of the king and of the French government. So when you went to the Native Americans, you brought them gifts. If you were wanted to build a fort or something like that, you sought their approval, you paid them rent by giving them gifts. Uh, you had peace, Frenchmen intermarried with the, with, the, with the Illinois and other tribes in order to make kinship bonds. They did things like that. And there was only a handful of French anyway. So they had relatively, with one exception we'll talk about, they had relatively good um, relationships with the tribes. When the British won the Seven Years' War and French had to give up, give up their holdings east of the Mississippi River, um, the British came in and said, no, you're not allowed, no Native American, you're not allowed in our fort, you want rent, what are you nuts? Um, even if they had uh, guns and things to give, they, they couldn't have because the Brits were at war elsewhere in the world. And so within six months period or so, they really angered the tribes of the Great Lakes. And that's when Pontiac in 1763 started his rebellion and took almost all of the British forts with the exception of Detroit and Pittsburgh. And the British learned a lesson there that we have to be nice to these people and deal with them as equals. So the British changed the way they did it. So when the Americans came out, 
that's when, no, the Americans did not follow that British model. And so the tribes allied themselves with the British. But in the end, guys like Shabana knew that the Americans are coming. We can't stop this. The best we can do is try to get the best deal that we can get. And so he became a friend of the Americans. He had a village at the Fox and Illinois Rivers right near today's Ottawa High School. But he's known from warning the settlers in 1832 before the Indian Creek incident here in LaSalle County. And people remembered that. For his good work, government gave him a, a whole section, a square mile of land in DeKalb County, somewhere probably right about where those trees are right there. But the problem was the land was given to him before the county was surveyed. This was, he was basically given an island out in, front of, out in the middle of the unsurveyed prairie. Well, he went west because his sister, because of that Pottawatomie Treaty, 1833, his sister moved west. Shabana was allowed to stay. But when he came back after a couple of years, he found that the land had been surveyed and his property had been sold. Old Shabana is homeless. What to do now? He lost everything. Well, the citizens of Ottawa remembered old Shabana during his helping uh, during the uh, Black Hawk War of 1832. And they had a, held a gala to collect money for Shabana. And they did. And they purchased land in Grundy County right here, this land, 10 acres called the Shabana Reserve. And it's in his family's name forever and in perpetuity. And it's known today as the Shabana Reserve. South side of the Illinois River, oh, about four miles west of Illinois, uh, Route 47. Well, by 1840, the Potawatomies are still leaving Illinois. It was reported five, 600 Potawatomi and Odawas passed through the Star Rock area on their way. More expected soon. One newspaper report said the group was in good health and were said to have made quite a display. But during their exodus, a local poet wrote the following words. And this is really sad. And this is the last part of the poem. It's called, They Are Passing Away, 18, from 1840. When the broad Mississippi's dark waters are crossed, when their homes and their country to them will be lost, in the march of improvement will soon leave no trace in the land of their birth of a once noble race, but their name will remain far on forest and flood from the mountain to sea. It is written in blood. They are passing away. This lament is kind of indicative of what maybe the people saw here of a, of a noble foe, but it's in complete conflict to what was going on at the time too, is that a, a manifest destiny is concerned. This is the last group we'll talk about, the Sauk and Meskwaki, the Meskwaki also known as the Fox. You can see the Meskwaki, the Fox had winter camps here in uh, 1680 and around that period in Northern Illinois. And so did their really close associates, the Kickapoo and Muscootin too. So you can see here, and this is LaSalle's 1684 map. You can see a Kickapoo village here, Muscootin village here. The Rock River is called the Kickapoo River and that. They weren't part of this quote colony, but they were living in the area at the time. The Kickapoo and Muscootin were very close allies with the Meskwaki until 1728 when they had a dispute about a couple of French prisoners um, that were taken. The Meskwaki are probably known in Illinois best for partic participation in what we call the Fox Wars. And this would have been between 1712 and about 1734. The Meskwaki attacked French interests and anyone allied with the French, including the Illinois and the Peoria who lived on the Illinois River at Starved Rock and at Peoria in particular. And this whole incident, this whole war started out, excuse me, the French would paddle through the Great Lakes. They would go through Meskwaki territory in Wisconsin to get to the Sioux markets, the large Sioux markets. The Sioux would get guns and ammunition and knives and hatchets from the French and then use them on the Meskwaki. And the Meskwaki got tired of that real fast. It would be as if people from Canada were driving through the United States to sell Mexicans atomic bombs to drop on the United States. We wouldn't put up with it and the Meskwaki didn't put up with it either. And so they attacked all French interests. All the rivers in Illinois and Southern Wisconsin were dangerous places to be the Wisconsin River, the Fox River, the Illinois River, the Rock River. That's why the French tended to go farther south to the Ohio River. Eventually, it became a French campaign of genocide, a 
against the Meskwaki. In 1728, the governor, Bornhau, Bar, Bonahau, <laughs> easy for me to say, Bonahau, <laughs> look it up, I'll look it up, became a French campaign against of genocide against the Meskwaki. He literally said that, look, uh, we'd like to get along with them folks and like to settle this issue, but the better expedient would be to destroy them. And so the French went after them with their Indian allies wholeheartedly. There was only a handful of Meskwakis left and they took shelter with their close cousins, the Sauk at Green Bay, where they had a, the Sauk had a fortified village. The French came, a captain named Divier came with a group of soldiers, small group of soldiers and demanded the Meskwaki be handed over to them. The Sauk said, nope, can't have them. So the French tried breaking the door down, which was a mistake because the, the Sauk fired at the French, killing several of them. Now there was only a handful of French soldiers there anyway. So the Sauk had to get out of Dodge and they did. And they took off, they threw Iowa, the parts of Illinois, and they ended up in Iowa. Uh, they were besieged by the French. The French had no food. Their native uh, allies abandoned them. And they said, this is enough. And so the French said, okay, fine, they're, they're done. So they, they quit their pursuit and focused their efforts south in the lower Mississippi River against tribes like the Chickasaw. Okay. That's what brought the Sauk and the Fox to Western Illinois, into Iowa. And they established Sauconuk, their village near Milan or East Moline around the year 1735. That was Blackhawk's village. Would have been right about there. Then there's the Black Hawk War of 1832. Um, the Black Hawk War is a direct result of a bad treaty uh, that the United States government tricked the Sauk into signing in 1804. In 1804, uh, a group of Indians from Sauk and Fox Indians from Sauconuk, that village, um, attacked and killed several settlers around the St. Louis area. Well, the locals caught those Indians and had them, had them arrested. Uh, a delegation of Sauk Indians came down and says, look, how do we make this right? You know, what do we got to do? You know, whatever, whatever it takes, we want our people back. Um, and so what they did, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. They put this treaty in front, which they all gave their mark. Well, that treaty signed all their land away, even land that wasn't their land to sign away. They were allowed to live on that land in that area until it was sold by the United States government. And that's what happened starting around the year 1830 and Americans are starting moving. During the winter, those Sauk and Fox would go west of the Mississippi River for the buffalo hunt. They would return after the hunt in the spring and find that their village is ripped up, torn apart, and there's a log cabin sitting there. Well, that really angered them because they probably had forgotten anything about this treaty that they were tricked into signing. Well, Blackhawk, a Sauk war chief refused to leave. So he came into Illinois and his basically his goal was try to connect with the Potawatomi from Chicago. He moved up the Fox River, I'm sorry, the Rock River to meet with the Potawatomi. Um, the Potawatomi, they didn't want any part of this. So by this time, the men, women, old ch the children, old folks are now in a pretty bad way. Uh, the Winnebago's hid them up in the swamps near Horicon Marsh in, in southern Wisconsin. And then they realized we better get out of here. If we can make it to Iowa, we'll be safe. Uh, the, the army and the militias won't be after us. So they made a beeline in the starving condition that they were in across southern Wisconsin. And when they got to the Mississippi River, uh, they really ran into a fix. The Indian agents of the Sioux upstream told them that, hey, your Sauk and Fox enemies are going to be coming across the river here. Why don't you wait for them? And then a steamboat called the Warrior with a piece of artillery on it raked them when the people were trying to swim across the river. And behind them this way was the army and the militia group who just tore the poor folks to, to shreds. They were slaughtered at the Mississippi and it was called the Battle of the Bad Axe. That was 1832, and the Black Hawk War was the last year, or the, I'm sorry, was the second to last Indian war with the United States government east of the Mississippi River. The last one would have been the Seminoles. 
But 1832 was the year to rid the state of Illinois of Indians. The United States government made a treaty with the Sauk, the Meskwaki, the Winnebago, Potawatomi, and with the Illinois. The days of the Illinois Native Americans are gone. So in summary, Illinois Amerindian history reaches back 10,000 years, quite a long time. But by 1832, they had ceded the remain of their claimed territory in Illinois to the United States government. So hopefully you learned a little something from this presentation about the mostly untold yet fascinating Amerindian history of our state. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much.